it, um, I entitled it, Where Has All the Structure Gone? And so if you have turned on the news or turned on a TV or talked to anybody, you'll notice that structure has seemed to disappear. And what do I mean by structure? I'm, I mean biblical structure. I mean scripture. I mean incorporating God into everything that we do. And um, ushers, you may be seated. The one thing I was thinking of as I was reading through this scripture is where do we get this structure from? And, and what is our first example of structure? And uh, before we get a little bit into the background, um, I have to tell you, uh, I didn't grow up uh, in a two-parent household. Um, I grew up with a mother, but my mother's default was Jesus. And so what, what do I mean by that? I may not have grown up with a father, but in times of need, the default was Jesus. And so when I was struggling or I had questions and she couldn't answer them, her default was Jesus. And so aside from my loving wife, um, we really have to take a look into this scripture a little bit deeper than just the woman submitting because we have to look at where this submission is going to. And so I, I just want you to think of that before we really get into this scripture. We're going to be talking a lot about submission, but in that submission, there's a structure behind that. And the structure default is Jesus. And so many of you know, I, I work construction. And uh, within the field I work in, it, it's called earthwork construction. So before your local Publix, before the gas station where you stop to get gas, before the Walgreens was there, it was a plot of land. And in this plot of land, uh, what my company is responsible for is creating the foundation. And so you're like, okay, evangelist, let's see where you're going with this structure, you know, foundation, you work construction. Yeah, yeah, we get it. But it, it's a little bit deeper than that because before it was the Publix, there, there was a plan, okay? And an engineer had created this plan. And so if you were just quickly reading through these scriptures, uh, the first thing that people tend to hear is, oh, the woman's got to submit to the man. And, and so this is the wrong way of looking at it. And I say this because in, in construction, there's a plan. And what is the plan? Everybody has to refer back to the plan. And so at one point in time, our structure was to refer back to the Bible. It wasn't to refer to the guy down the street or the woman down the street or let's hit the internet or, you know, uh, they call them birds chirping, whatever the birds were saying. We weren't listening to these things. Our structure was biblical. And so we had this biblical structure. And so because of this, what started to happen? Okay, we have this time period where our structure, not only as a country, but as a people, goes back to Jesus. That was our default button. What does God say? What does God say about marriage? What does God say about raising children? What does God say about education? I mean, these were everything got brought back to, well, what does scripture say? And so I, I have to bring this up because sometimes, not myself included, but sometimes somebody will get this bright idea and they'll say, well, maybe we can make this foundation stronger. And so what has to happen? They have to have a meeting. They go to the engineer. The engineer says, well, what, what does the plan say? And, and so I just start to think this is funny because so many meetings of going, well, well, what does the plan say? And I'm looking out into society and I'm saying, well, what does the Bible say? And so there aren't enough people who are in agreement to say this. N nobody here, nobody viewing and online, but the world isn't saying, what does scripture say? They're not hitting the default button of, well, what are the plans? Are they, are they coming from the creator? And so it's very interesting because what, what has happened over a time period is we miss a little bit more of the structure and a little bit more of the structure goes away and a little bit more of the structure goes away and a little bit more of the structure goes away. And then we find ourselves 
in the present day. And so the reason I bring this up is because here in church, we say, well, what does scripture say? What does the plan say? And the world tells us, no, 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 we, we have a better way. We can do it a better way. We can process it a better way. We can build your foundation a different way. And what is always promised throughout the timeline, we went over this a, a little bit in Sunday school this morning, that the prophesying of the Messiah. And so I bring this up because we get to this point where when you're a Christian, you're going to scripture to find out what scripture says. You're building your foundation upon that scripture. And so when somebody comes to you, you find yourself less asking your friend and hitting your default button and going back to scripture and saying, well, what does scripture say? And so as you find yourself less and less trying to go to all your friends, you find yourself saying, well, where has all the structure gone? Because at some point, it's just become a free-for-all. And so structure is not only important in marriage or in friendship or in everything that we do. It's, it's the backbone. It's the foundation on which we draw what we pass down to our children. And so if we're not passing down to our children, male, female, marriage, relationship, having children, bringing them to church, or a default, and I say this because the default switch would be Jesus. If you're a single parent, I told you, I grew up with a single parent. I didn't grow up with a father in the home, but my mother's default button was Jesus. It was scripture. It was go to God. And so we've lost this part of the structure coming along the way. And so in, in the construction business, we would say, well, what did the plans say? Go back to the plans. What was the original plan? You think you have a better idea? What did the original engineer say? And so again, this is where we find ourselves saying, where has all the structure gone? Because society is telling us, everything under the sun other than what does the scripture say? What does Bible say? And so before we even get into today's scripture, as I was going through it and reading it, it it's very important to notice that there's a clear division in this epistle into two halves of nearly equal length. And so I say that because the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, namely called the doctrinal section. And then the second half of that being the practical section, which would be chapters four through six, provide a strong sense of structural unity within the epistle. So notice that even within scripture, there's a structure. And so in this structure, where are we going back to? And this is where I started to think, where has the structure gone? Where have we gotten away from? And so if you were following along, in the 21st verse, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And so this is very important, this line, in the fear of God. Why? We went over this in Sunday school uh, quite some time ago, but this is a respect for the Lord, okay? This isn't to be... Uh, I, I'm afraid of God. No, this is a reverence. This is an understanding. This is a respect that we have for God. And so what's happening is we pick up in this 21st verse, but in the preceding verses, there were three things that were happening. And so they were results of being spirit-filled. And so this would be the fourth result of being spirit-filled, is that there's a mutual submission that is showing difference to the wishes of one another. And as long as that which to the believer submits in the fear of God, this would be in accordance to say, we are doing God's will and what pleases God. And so why is this so important? You can only do this filled with the Spirit wanting to seek God, wanting to do God's will. And so this is going to be our reset button. 
Okay, this 21st verse, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Here's our reset. And why do I say this? Because it's spirit filled. And so if you're, uh, if you have a message Bible at home, the message Bible says out of respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. And so I don't know about you, but if you've ever seen the passion of the Christ or you think of the Savior being crucified, I don't know about you, but thinking in reference to me, it, it tears me up sometimes. And so in the Message Bible, this would be a respect, understanding what Christ did on my behalf I would want to courteously be reverent to everybody else. I would want to understand that these are God's creations that we're dealing with. And so when anger comes into play, when, oh, well, I don't like that person or I want to implement my own opinion, I have to remember this mutual respect I have for Christ. And so I have to respect and submit in my own right. But where's the default button? It has to be in this fear of God. It has to be out of respect. And so what the world tells us, we hear this word submit, submission, and the world tells us don't submit. You shouldn't submit to anybody. You shouldn't submit to anything. There is no such thing as submitting. You're giving up. And when you give up, you're being a coward. And so the world teaches us that this is a bad word. And what does scripture tell us? Scripture tells us to go back to the plan, just like at my job. We have to go back to the plan. What does the plan say? The plan says we have to submit. And so if we're going based on what scripture says, scripture says that we, in the individual respect, have to submit ourselves humbly, obediently to Christ. And so it's interesting because the picture that scripture paints would be a kind of submission. And so in this kind of submission, what we would have to do is go back to the beginning. And why do I say go back to the beginning? Because as we go through the next couple of verses, we're going to hear things like wives submit to your husbands. And so we have to understand where this part of this submission is coming to and what the default button is. The reset button is when a wife submits to her husband, she's doing it in submission that the husband is submitting to Christ. And so this is very important. Why is this very important? We're going to get into it, but let's jump back a little bit. For you note takers, Genesis chapter 3 verse 16. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. And it reads, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow that shall bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Seems very basic, but this would be what does the plan say? Where is the structure? See, this is after the curse. This is after their sin. And so this is what we're getting into. If you catch this similarity that you keep hearing, if you've been to church, you know, a time or two, you hear stuff like Christ and his bride. And so Christ being the bridegroom and the church, the body, us being the bride, you start to hear these things. And so when they start to take our structure away, when they start to go after the marriage, when they start to go after the scripture, what are they trying to do? They're trying to erase this evidence. They're trying to get rid of the fact that scripturally, this is how it started. And so when we say, let's go back to the plans, and we go to a verse like Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, and we get a little bit more of, it, of information, this is what the world's trying to do. They're trying to erase that. They don't want you to go back. They don't want you to know the truth. And so what is the scripture or the plans as we say? See, this word for sorrow means birth pangs. And so it sounds like the Hebrew word for tree. Tree. 
And so this is a reminder of the source of pain in the sin involving the tree of what? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so it looks forward to the crucifixion when the curse ultimately hung on a tree. And so why do we bring this up? Because it brings up the word desire. And so this desire has been variously interpreted, interpreted, but the first version of this interpretation is a physical desire strong enough to compensate for the pain of childbirth. And so why do we bring this up? Why? Because if we go back to the plans and follow with me on this, okay? Physical desire strong enough to compensate for the pain of childbirth all my mothers in here, you know how painful childbirth is. You know how painstaking and what it does to your body, okay? But when it's your husband who is following Christ, he loves and understands all of the sacrifice that you go through through that childbirth. And so when we go back to the beginning and we start here and we start to understand the woman's going to go through some things. And so when Satan tries to tempt us through that lust and, and all of these things, casting it aside, don't worry about what's going to happen. What has the world taken with our structure? See, structure was for the man and the woman to be married and to multiply. And so now they say it can just be a man or a woman, or it can be whatever. And if they get pregnant, they can have an abortion. And so you see how over time we've taken away, the world has eaten at this structure, at this structure, at this structure, and they've tried to make it okay. And so if you're a Christian and you're standing up and you're saying, no, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in the word, let's go back to the plan. What does scripture say? You have to stand firm in this. And you have to stand firm in this. Why? Because we're talking about a desire. And so the second part of this desire would be a natural desire to submit to her husband's leadership. And so why, again, do we bring this up? See, this is a key word, the husband, okay? The covenant joining the two. The one is the structure behind her submission, which means what? He must submit to God. And who is he? He is her husband. And so if the wife is submitting to the husband, the husband is submitting to God. And so now we're going back to structure because at one point we have this sin, we have this curse. And so it's all leading us up to what? One day we would need Jesus. No matter what, from the beginning, it's always been the same. Lesson through lesson in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, it's all leading up to the same thing. And so now we have this evidence. And what is the evidence? That the evidence of the man and the woman who get married, the two becoming one, they are now the example of what it's like to turn away from that sin and be the example of what a Christian marriage should look like. And so how do we know that this is difficult? See, it's important to bring this up because the world gives this distorted view of marriage. And what do they say? Well, you're going to be with one person the rest of your life. And those husbands in the room say, yay and amen, because it's difficult enough to deal with one woman, let alone to deal with multiple women. And so why do we start to talk about all these things because this is the evidence in the scripture that we're looking for. When somebody says, how, how have we gotten here? How have we got from dating to jumping to girlfriend? And it doesn't talk about a girlfriend in the Bible, but it, what does it talk about? It talks about this husband and the wife, but it talks about the fear of God. And so we have this structure and we keep getting further and further and further and further. And what's happened? The further we get away, we've gotten what? We've gotten abortion. We've gotten the LGBTQ issues. We've gotten the what a relationship is. We've gotten the what is a woman? What is a man? What is the role? Where is it supposed to play? Who is the alpha? Who is the beta? See, we, we, we've mixed it with all these questions. And Christians say, 
well, what does scripture say? What do the plans say? And the world says, well, we don't go by the plan. We go by what we say we want to go by. And so one thing that we have to look at is when we're hitting this reset button, we keep hitting this reset button. And as pastor says, I'll drop this one off for free. Our reset button with everything is our go-to with anyone in any situation. And why do I say that? Because the fear of God, those who are, who are confused or scared or they don't know, what's our reset button? Our reset button is go to God. This is what we tell everybody. You have a question? We bring them where? We bring them to scripture. Well, what does God say? We bring them where? We bring them in prayer. Pastor calling before, let's go in prayer. The gospel angels pray before they go up. Tuesdays we pray. That Tuesday thread group has turned into an everyday thread group, but this is a structure that's been evidently passed down through somebody that we know that believed in Christ that believed the same thing. They wanted to stand on that foundation of being a Christian. And so where did they stand? They stood in the scripture and they said, hey, we have to pray. When somebody asks for it, you go and you pray with them. And at first we said, well, I'm just going to go pray with somebody. And we said, yes, go out and pray. It doesn't matter. Ask them their name, hold them by the hand, ask them what you want them to pray for and you pray. And so this structure, this structure that happens, this is what we're passing down to our children. And so in this fifth chapter and leading into the sixth chapter in the book of Ephesians, this submission and authority is treated in three domestic relationships. The first being wives and husbands is what the epistle is talking about. The second would be children and parents is what he goes into. And then he ends with servants and masters. Now I have to tell you when I was sitting down and I was praying and I was going through getting all the notes and reading the scripture and, and putting uh, this message together, I, I, I wrote down on a little sheet of paper, God, and then the, the second one that I wrote down was whatever relationship you were in. And so it works for anything. And you say, evangelist, how does that work? Okay, well, I'm married. This is my wife. My wife brings me something. It's my responsibility and duty as her husband to bring her in spiritual leadership first, not just to provide for her. Those are secondary things. I need to spiritually lead her. And how do I do that? I need to submit myself to Christ. And so there's the structure. There's this hierarchy, and it works. Whether you're a single female, what is your responsibility? This is your season. Maybe you're a single mother. Maybe you're just a single female. Maybe you're wondering what God has in store for you. So what would you need to be doing? You would need to be submitting yourself unto Christ, and he would be working out the rest of it. And so the same would go for a single male or a single father. And so there would be this backup, this reset button. Where are we going? We're going back to Jesus. We're going back to the scripture. What does the structure say? And so my wife and I have had this conversation on several terms. I call it structure and empathy. My wife is empathy, I'm structure. And without empathy, structure that we're talking about has to be biblical structure. If I was raising my two boys on my own, I wouldn't be able to give them empathy. But you know where I would be bringing them? I'd be bringing them to church. And so when I'm bringing them to church, what's at church? There's females who are there who are empathetic. And so you see how each default, if you're bringing your kids to the right place, it has a default. And that's why I say that this default button needs to be Christ. It needs to be scripture. Why? Because when something's missing, the only way to fill that is with Christ, is with Jesus. It can only be filled. You have a hole in your heart? Only Jesus can fill that hole. You feel like you're missing something in your life? Go do service and see how Jesus fills that hole. You feel like you're not doing enough? 
ask Jesus to give you something to do. And I guarantee your plate will be so overflowed with things to do, you might have to pray to dial it back a little bit. And so as we continue on in the 22nd verse, and, he, and here's, here's where most people get lost. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's the King James Version. I'm going to read you the message version as well. It says, wives, understand and support your husbands in ways that you show your support for Christ. And so I think it's important that we understand in this 22nd verse, this is where we usually lose people. Why? Because what they heard, which is not what I read, what I read was, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. They heard women submit yourselves to men. But that's not what the scripture says. And so that's where people get lost. And so that's where the world will try and distort that structure. Why? Because in this 22nd verse, the structure was wives. And so at this point, you're married. So you've made this covenant where the two have become one. So you know that your partner has the capability of submitting himself or herself to Christ, if you've gotten to this point, then this has been something that you've probably talked about a little bit. And so again, we hear this word, submit. And so there's a theme going on here, and the ones who earnestly seek the word are seeking a deeper meaning in this scripture when we say submit. And how do I know this? Because for every woman who is a woman of God in this room, you didn't bat an eyelash when I said, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. And why didn't you? Because you have either the, the equal of being led by a man who is following Christ, submitting himself to Christ, who is leading you in all things in all areas of your life, leading you back to scripture, leading you back to Christ. Or if you're a single woman, you know that Jesus is your savior. And so your fallback button that you're going to is your scripture. You're coming back to the scripture. You're coming back to the structure, which just says what? I'm in a season right now, but you will get to a season if that's what God has deemed for you, where you will be able to submit to your husband. And so we need to go a little deeper. And the reason we want to go a little deeper is because Satan interjects himself here. And so how do we know that? Because society and Satan will tell you literally, this is the time for what? Well, if I'm submitting, then, then I should have to have a say somewhere else. If I, if I don't have a say here and I'm, I'm submitting myself here, well, well, I should have a say somewhere else. And so this is very interesting because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, the very last interpretation of that is that the woman will want to control the husband. Let me rephrase that. The wife will want to control the husband and ultimately he will rule over her. And so we know that this comes from the original curse, but we also know from structure that when we are submitting ourselves first off one to another, then we have the submission of Christ. Then we have the husband and the wife. And so that's where our scripture is bringing us today. We're talking about a wife and a husband and so the rest of the relationships all go back to this default button. And so in the 23rd verse, now here's where we kick it up a notch. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. And so this is the King James version of that. And once again, I, I have to read you the message version because it paints it so very clearly. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to the church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. And so this is very important. Why? Because Christ is not showing up on our doorstep saying, you worship me now. And so as a husband, I'm not going to my wife and throwing things at her. And what do I mean by that? I'm not giving her a list and saying, hey, you better get all this done. Why? Because I'm the husband and you're the wife. No, it's not how that works. 
this word for in the King James Version gives the reason why verse 22 called for the wifely submission. Remember, we're in the 23rd verse. In the 22nd verse, it says wives should submit unto the husbands. And so just as Jesus is the appointed head or authority over the church, the same as the husband and divinely appointed head or the authority over the wife. And so this is a very key factor here. This is very important. Why is this very important? Because just as the wife was tasked with submitting to the husband, there was a default button there. And so if you had any type of of study Bible, whether it's a King James or an NIV or an NLT, what they would talk about is that there's a condition of that wife's submission. And that's if the husband is submitting himself unto Christ in what? In the fear of God, which we went over and said out of respect for God. And so the husband has to be walking in the light of the spirit. And how do we know that? Because in verse 21, it talked, this was the fourth spirit-filled thing that we are to do when filled with the spirit is this part of submission one to another and so do you see how first it was submission in one respect and it was submission in another respect but the default button is the structure and so as we take the structure away and we try to well you can do that over there we'll be okay with that and and i guess we're okay no 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 we have to stand fully on the word of God. We have to stand rooted firmly on the foundation. Why? Because what do the plans say? This is what the plans say. And so this is very important because at this point, we know that Jesus, the savior, is the protector of the body. And so as Jesus is responsible to provide for the welfare of the church, so the husband is responsible to protect the wife. And so in both cases, the responsibility to protect is inseparably linked with the responsibility to provide spiritual leadership. And that's what I started with. In order for the husband to lead, he has to be able to lead her spiritually first. And he has to be submitting himself unto Christ so that he can what? Spiritually lead his wife And so you see now how this structure is so important. Why? Because we know that when the two become one, they're to do what? They're to multiply. And so if I can't spiritually lead my wife, how am I expected to spiritually lead my children? And how am I expected to spiritually lead those who I come into contact with in reading the gospel, in letting the word go forth and not come back void? This is something that we hear. See, if I can't start with spiritual leadership, then nine times out of 10, I'm not going to be able to provide financially. I'm not going to be able to protect her in the ways that she wants protected. And and these aren't literal terms. What do I mean by protection? See, if my wife comes home and she has a terrible day or something goes on at work, what does she come home to do? She comes home to tell me, And when she comes home to tell me, what am I responsible for protecting first and foremost, her spirituality? I can't let her get angry and I can't jump on the bandwagon if she wants to hurt somebody. What do I have to do? I have to spiritually lead her and say, okay, well, well, let's take this in prayer. Let's go before the Lord. Let's seek God. Why? Why are we seeking God? Because I must protect her emotions. Why? because that's my responsibility as a husband. It's not just to physically protect her from harm. It's to protect her from everything that might come after her. And what would that be? That would be temptation. That would be Satan. Satan would want what? Desiring her for what? To go against me, to separate us, to have me saying one thing and to have her saying another. And so why? Because this evidence of the marriage that we're supposed to be as husband and wife, the two becoming one, this is the representation of what Christ is to us. We are the body. He is the bridegroom. We know that he is the savior. He is our protector. He is everything to us. And how do we know that? That's evident in that marriage. That's the evidence that we would turn away and want to live a Christian marriage. We'd want to be strong. 
And again, I say this for those that might be single, you may not be married yet. Where's your default? Scripture. Your default button is Christ. It's the same for me and my wife. The default button has to be with Christ. And so that's why it's so important when they're talking about this relationships, we're just focusing on one in Ephesians right now, but Ephesians talks about this parent, child, master, servant. And so I bring this up because it's very important if my boys were to hear me say something out of line to my wife, now this becomes the standard. And so this is where we've lost structure. Why? Because we've seen men say and do things to women. And there's no husband. There's no husband to stand in the gap. There's no priest provider and protector. There's nobody saying, where is the structure? And the church has gotten quiet. It's gotten quiet on subjects like this. And so as I was studying these scriptures, I really started to think, what is society doing? Society is trying to get rid of the evidence. And what's the evidence? What does the evidence look like? The evidence looks like the Christian marriage. And so as we go into this 24th verse, it says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And so the Message Bible reads it, So just as the church submits to Christ, as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. And so the extent of the wife's submission to her husband is in everything. But here's the stipulation. It's in every area of life. It's in every issue that may arise. And it's with those that the wife may agree with or that she might not agree with. And again, it's in everything. But what is it limited to? Those directives is that the husband has to fear God. And so there's our default is that if the husband is conforming to God's will, then as we start to read these verses, it takes on a little bit deeper context than the wife just submitting to the husband. There's a little bit of backbone. There's a little bit of structure here. So for everybody who picks out this scripture and says, oh, well, why do women have to submit to men? And you say, show me in scripture where it says that. Please show me in scripture. What it says is wives will submit themselves to their husband under the stipulation of what? That the husband is in the fear of the Lord. And so now this structure that we're trying to build back, this structure that we've seen disappear, we've seen this structure disappear on many levels, not only in marriage and the way we teach our children and what the world tells us is acceptable. And so again, we see that this dependence of the wife's submission is solely on the husband's submission to God. And so I bring this up again and again and again. Why? Because there aren't enough men who are submitting themselves to Christ. There aren't enough men who are standing up for what they believe in and saying, this is wrong. And why is this wrong? Because we've gotten away from the structure. And so the very design that we rest our faith in, this example, this evidence of the marriage, this is what the world is trying to destroy. And so if we say that Christ is the bridegroom and that the church, we are his bride, then wouldn't it be fitting? Do you see now how if we get rid of the structure, it's less believable? when we bring the word, when we bring the gospel, when we tell somebody to read scripture and we say, Jesus is the only hope. He's our savior. He's the one. Not only will he fix it, but he's coming back. And they say, where's the evidence? And we turn around and we say, but I I, I believe. And they say, okay, show me the evidence. See, originally the evidence was supposed to be in the Christian marriage. That was supposed to be a little bit of that evidence. It was supposed to be a little bit of a help to the people. When we were reading scripture and you say, well, what am I supposed to do with my life? And I don't understand. And this was part of it. There was a man and a woman and they got married and the man became the husband 
and the woman became the wife. And so the two became the one, and in their joining, there was a set of structural rules for them to follow to be that evidence. And in the 25th verse, and I love this, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so right now you're probably thinking, okay, the wife is submitting herself unto the husband as long as he's submitting himself unto God. It seems like the husband got off pretty easy. I'd, I'd say as a husband, we seem to get off pretty easy. I just have to go to work. I'm not responsible for a lot of the other stuff that my wife is. But what does this mean? See, when you lose structure, we lose sight of what this verse means. I'm going to read it one more time. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so the marital responsibility of the husband is to love your wife. Remember, I said priest, provider, and protector. And so the Greek word that we're all familiar with is agapo, agape, which denotes the willing sacrificial giving on the husband's part for the benefit of his wife without the thought of return. And so we're going we're gonna to pause right there for a second because what does that mean? What does that mean? She's the only shot I get. That's it. That's it. If we start looking at it from this standpoint and not, I can replace her, which is what the world is telling us we can do. Well, you can replace them. And so what do we see? We see a lot of marriages, people getting married, and the husband's not willing to take this step. If somebody came in right now with a weapon, not only do I have to be prepared to lay down my life for her, but I have to be prepared to lay down my life for everybody in this church. And so that's what I've been charged with. And so that's what the husband's charged with, is that as Christ gave himself for the church, there is to be no sacrifice that not even the laying down of his own life, talking in regards of the husband, that he should not be willing to make for his wife. And so this is a big step. Why? Because Christ gave himself sacrificially for us. It's what he did for us on that cross. And he didn't have to. Just like we don't have to get married. You could stay single your entire life. And that's what I think is, is interesting is all the back and forth of who actually wrote this epistle. Uh, Paul is believed to have written this epistle. Some would argue otherwise, but this is very Pauline, this writing. And so notice Paul gave himself unto Christ to follow Christ. And there's other places in scripture where Paul goes through and he tells us, Everybody is in a season. His season was not to be married. But how do we know that this information that Paul is giving us is true and correct information? And it kind of has to do with this morning's Sunday school lesson. And so what's happening is everybody plays a part. How does everybody play a part? Well, some of us were to be single. Some of us play a part of being married. Some of us play a part in the courtship. Because before we got married, there was a courtship. There had to be a getting to know each other. There had to be seeing if the views line up. And so why do I say that? The structure for do our views line up was the Bible. That was our structure. Do your views match my views? I don't know. Let me meet your pastor. Would you like to come to church with me? And so now the views start structurally lining up. And so this is what we do out in society. We start to align our views with what we believe. And what do we believe? We believe what scripture tells us. And so it doesn't matter what the valor, the honor, the duty to be charged with such a task. It's the husband's responsibility. And so it doesn't matter what comes my way. It's my responsibility to protect her. It's my responsibility to provide for her. And what is the exchange? The exchange is she takes 
the childbirth. And so when you have a husband who's following in Christ, I understand that her body is going to go through some changes. And so why do we say this? Because in society, we've gone through some changes, except what society did, what the world did, is they threw the plans, the Bible, the scripture, they threw it right out the window. And they said, we don't believe in that. We don't want to go by that. We've never seen Jesus. We don't know if he's real. And so why does this charge keep coming and coming and coming? Even though we've gotten away from the structure, this 26th verse ties it all together. And it reads, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And who are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus. And so this verse could be paraphrased that he might perfectly sanctify the church, having cleansed her by the gospel, accompanied with the washing of water. And so some questions you might ask is, when will he perfectly sanctify the church? When he returns for her in glory. And when was the church cleansed at conversion? And so how was her conversion affected? It was affected by the gospel. And so why, again, is this so important? See, husband to wife, if I'm spiritually leading her, I'm spiritually bringing her to the word. And everything that she has a question about, that she comes to me about, but what else am I charged with? See, there were other relationships. There was parent to child. I'm doing this with my children. And so where is this evident? I'm trying to pass this down. I'm trying to pass down this structure. Why? Because this structure is missing. And so when this structure is missing, we're missing this structure. We're missing empathy. And so what are we missing? We're missing the larger picture is that this isn't the last stop. This isn't home. This is just a place we are passing through. And how do we know that? Well, scripture told us what Jesus did on the cross for us. It laid out this evidence of not only what we can read about, but what Jesus was talking about in the Bible. And so if you'll skip with me, John chapter 15, verse 3. John chapter 15, verse 3, and I'll read it for you. It says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And so this is so important. In in your Bible, this, uh, this verse should be in red. And it means that it's Jesus talking. And so what Jesus was explaining to the disciples is the divine human relationship, and he was giving the analogy of the grapevine. And so follow along because this is so important. How fitting is this for the marriage, right? If Jesus is the grapevine and and he's explaining to his disciples about the branches and and he goes in to talk about this, what, what is it ultimately is happening here? See, if Jesus is the main vine... Then the other little branches, okay, and the leaves, they're going to do what? They're going to bear fruit. But only if the living connection is secured to the main vine. So this is the evidence of a good Christian marriage, and this is why it's important. Why? Because if I'm submitting myself to Christ, and and I'm latching on, and my wife is submitting herself unto me, and she's latching on, and we're latching on to the main vine, which is Christ, then we have the marriage that is evident of what a good Christian marriage should look like. Why? Because I'm holding on to the main vine, and I'm telling my wife, hold on to me as I hold on to the main vine. And what is my wife saying? She's saying to our children, the ones, the bear, the fruit that will be bare." She's saying, hold on to me while I hold on to your father, while he holds on to the main branch. And so do you see now how there's a structure, there's a hierarchy, there's a leadership. And so we just look at this word submission. Oh, that's a bad word. Don't say that. 
but I have to submit myself day in and day out just as my wife submits herself and we submit ourselves. Why? Because the two become one. And so now we're holding on to this main vine. We're holding on to this original branch. We're holding on to Jesus. And so from the beginning, God's focus has always been love and respect between the husband and wife. And God commands believers in Christ to pursue this ideal relationship, the ideal of being perfectly illustrated in God's relation, or Christ's relationship with the church. And so again, you might be sitting there, you might be saying, but I'm single. This is just a season for you. And so what are you to do in this season? You're supposed to latch on, latch on to that main vine. Why? Because your season is coming. And so if you see this evidence in the Christian marriages, like we see in Pastor Billy and Pastor Joyce, we have the Whites, my wife and myself, the Della Negras, we, we see these examples. And so when we get to that point, now what is there to do? It's already been laid out in structure. And how do we know that? Because we're holding on to the main vine. We're holding on to Jesus. We're holding on to Christ. And so if you're in your season of singleness, that's okay. Why? Because eventually, if you are a husband, you will get to the point of responsibility. And so when you get to the point of responsibility for your wife or wife submitting yourself unto your husband, if you've latched on to the main vine, and stay with me, if, if you've latched on to the main vine, if you've hit your reset button with Christ, then if you're a woman, when your husband comes, you'll know. You'll know that that's the one that God has picked for you. And husbands, the same thing. In your singleness, you'll know that this is the woman you're supposed to spend the rest of your life with. Why? Because you've latched on to Christ. You've gone through the structure. You've gone through the ups. You've gone through the downs. You've gone through your season of singleness. And so the rest of chapter five, we only focused on this one relationship between husband and wife. But what we start to see is Christ's people are renewed to new lives through this holiness of thought and word and deeds. And so what needs to happen? We have to reject the old sinful lifestyle. And so how do we know that? Well, that would be evidence, not only in your marriage, but in your relationship, your day-to-day -day relationship with your friends, with your coworkers, with your bosses. See, this is the evidence. And so we talk about this evidence and where do we get the evidence from? The evidence comes from the word. We have to latch on to this main vine, this main branch. And so what ultimately ends up happening is that once we get this holiness of life, it entails submission to proper authorities and loving and considerate care for everybody who is in submission to Christ. So what does this end up being? This is not only just me and my wife, this is to the congregation. We submit ourselves to Christ, everybody, on a daily basis. We submit ourselves to do what? To be the evidence, to be the holiness, to leave the sinful lifestyle that we once led, to turn away from. And the only way to do this is to latch on to that main vine. It's to have that structure. It's to read through scripture. And so when we start to ask ourselves, where has all the structure gone? Maybe we need to be the ones to bring the word. And so when we start to bring the word and, and we start to build people up in word and bring them to scripture and have them reading in the word and letting them know who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us, then we start saying a little bit less, where has all the scripture gone? And my God, my God, my savior, yay and amen. 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 amen.